Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us this morning for today's Veterans Mental Health Webinar. We are so excited to have you and uh, look forward to having a very um, in-depth discussion on mental health. And without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Congresswoman Lucy McBath. Oh, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, Megan. I am so pleased to convene this morning's mental health webinar, which is focused on our veterans. And you know, I come from a family of veterans myself and my father, brother, and nephew all served our nation. And I am proud to represent such a vibrant and growing population of veterans right here in Georgia. And in particular, I care very deeply about fostering good mental health for our veterans. Many service members may return home with invisible wounds, and I want any veteran who may be struggling to know that it's okay to reach out for help. Veterans have sacrificed so much for our country. For those men and women who have made the transition to life after military service, I am committed to doing all that I can to ensure that they have access to the services and benefits our Department of Veterans Affairs has to offer. And that is precisely why I have convened today's webinar with three phenomenal representatives from our nation's Department of Veterans Affairs to talk about their roles within the VA and educate those on the webinar with us this morning about resources and programs that promote good mental health and safety for our veterans, such as telehealth therapy and safe firearm storage. Joining me this morning are Dr. David Walker, board certified psychiatrist and VA network director for the Southeast Network Vision 7. Lauren Ruschen, licensed social worker and suicide prevention coordinator at the Atlanta VA Medical Center. And Doretha Barber, licensed clinical social worker and suicide prevention case manager at the Atlanta VA Medical Center. Dr. Walker. Yes. Uh, I'm so I'm so I'm so sorry. I and also Dr. and uh, Dr. Walker, Lauren, Doretha, I want to thank you all so much for your engagement with my office this morning. And thank you for the work that you do every single day to serve our veterans. I would also like to thank Dr. Myrick, uh, Hugh Myrick, who's also Chief Mental Health Officer for the VA Southeast Network, and Dr. Beck Bradley Devino. Chief of Mental Health for the Atlanta VA Healthcare System for joining us today on our webinar. Now, just a little bit, we're going to hear from um, Lauren and Doretha about suicide prevention and safe firearm storage. But first, we're going to begin this morning's program with a conversation with Dr. Walker. Now, Dr. Walker, you've been the director of Vision 7 since last summer. And prior to that, you've served in a variety of leadership roles with the VA across the country. You and I have had the opportunity to speak before, and I just want to say how grateful that I am for you and your team's partnership with my office. It's truly a pleasure to have you here with us this morning. And as you know, um, uh, I know that you have a very busy schedule. But before we get uh, started in our conversation, I just want to turn things over to you for a brief introduction of yourself to those that are joining us on this webinar. All right, well, well thank you. Uh, certainly it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I went to the military medical school run by the Army and then did psychiatry training in the Air Force and, and was in the Air Force until 2003. Uh, and then I uh, have worked in the state system. And then since 2009, I've been in the VA. Uh, I still see patients. I treat opioid addiction with a medication called Suboxone. And Suboxone is uh, FDA approved uh, to treat uh, addiction. And I have patients from 33 years of age to 74 years of age. And they all were started on the narcotic for legitimate reasons. But unfortunately, it got out of control. Uh, and with this medication, uh, I'm able to, what I call, help them get back into society. And then my uh, other part of my, my regular job is uh, over the eight medical centers throughout South Carolina, Georgia, 
in Alabama. But on Friday afternoons, it's my clinic day, and I enjoy uh, still uh, seeing patients to, to help them uh, get back into society. And I really appreciate this uh, opportunity to, to speak with you today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Walker. We're really, really glad to have you. Uh, and the first topic that I want to discuss with you is the general mental health of our veterans with a particular focus really on the last two years, in particular under COVID. I'm deeply concerned about how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected our veterans. Uh, I think we've spoken about this before and as a VA employee and someone who's still seeing patients yourself, can you just share with us how you believe veterans are coping with their mental health since the initial shutdown in 2020? Uh, so we have uh, been uh, fortunate uh, that the uh, uh, veterans uh, have uh, done well considering all the challenges, uh, but we're certainly really concerned about how the pandemic has impacted us. One of the ways it's impacted us, uh, of course, is the way we uh, provided the care. Uh, so for instance, switching to uh, telehealth or tele mental health is one of the ways. And then another thing that has impacted us is our own staffing. About a third of our employees are also veterans. And certainly all of healthcare has been impacted you know, by this. But, but we've adapted by using the technology, which I think has helped because appointments in mental health can occur on a smartphone, a tablet, a computer uh, and in person. Uh, but the nice thing is that using the technology, uh, we've been able to actually uh, increase and uh, see uh, more uh, of veterans during the pandemic. And that hasn't always been the case for other types of, of specialties. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I can tell you, uh, the Atlanta VA did just under 300,000 telehealth appointments in fiscal year 21, uh, leading the nation. Uh, and so the use of technology has been one of the ways to help us uh, with the pandemic uh, and how it's impacted uh, access. Uh, and, and lastly, some veterans have been uh, certainly concerned for going into a facility because they don't wanna get exposed. Uh, and the telehealth has really helped us with that. Well, thank you. And, you know, as I said in my opening remarks, we know how attractive Georgia and the metro Atlanta region is uh, in particular for so many veterans and their families when they're looking for a place to call home during their life after service. Uh, as a nationwide hub for veterans, can you just share with us some of the statistics on just how many veterans are actually utilizing mental health care services in Georgia and at the Atlanta VA. So uh, right at 64,000 uh, Georgians are receiving uh, uh, mental health care from uh, all three of the VAs within Georgia, uh, the Augusta, of course, Atlanta, Dublin, and then our clinic in Columbus, which is uh, served by the Central Alabama. Uh, about half of those are a little over 30,000 are here uh, receiving care in the Atlanta a region. And so it's uh, almost half. And for instance, we have the most female veterans of, uh, of any of the regions in the country. And what's also unique is that we have younger veterans. And we think the economy has driven that. Uh, more folks moving into Georgia due to the economy. So over 64,000 statewide and over 30,000 of those just at the Atlanta VA healthcare system itself. And then the average time for a new patient uh, to get an appointment is about 13 days. And if one is already an established patient, it's about four days. And again, those appointments have been both in person and using the technology uh, through either their tablet or their phone or their computer. Thank you. Well and also, can you just kind of share with us what kind of programs and resources that promote mental wellness uh, that are available to the to the veterans at any VA facility? 
Okay, so we're uh, very fortunate that Congress has given uh, the VA the resources uh, to treat uh, veterans. And so I'll break it down into uh, wellness. So we have programs that involve apps that on, the, on your smartphone or uh, on your computer, but really a smartphone or tablet that can help you with uh, everyday things. And some of those are specific to stress, some for PTSD. So we have apps. We have, of course, uh, in-person appointments. We have same day services and also uh, emergency uh, services. But basically I would say it's comprehensive mental health uh, for our veterans. Now, in addition, one of the things that the VA is very fortunate to have is experts in treating PTSD and also military sexual trauma and then, of course, things like depression, anxiety, and other types of illnesses that you can see uh, in veterans. We also have a program where we use peer supports. So it's the peer support program. And the peer is, some, is a veteran who has themselves, he or she has uh, experienced and been in treatment, and now they receive training and they're involved in working with veterans. So then it's not just a a therapist, it's actually a peer. And so we have the peer support program. And then lastly, uh, the vet centers, the Atlanta Vet Center is a resource The vet centers are separate from the hospital system, but they are there for those veterans who, you know, might initially feel a little hesitation to going to a hospital, but the vet centers also have the ability to do therapy with their veterans, active duty service members, their families, and certainly they offer certain types of counseling too. Well, in addition to the VA Medical Center indicator, you know, there's quite a bit of interest in the new VA clinic that is being constructed on Bells Ferry Road. Can you just share with us about what kind of progress has been made at that new VA clinic and when veterans in our area can expect to begin uh, utilizing the VA services at that location? Okay, so the Cobb County Multi-Specialty Clinic is one that um, uh, has been impacted somewhat by the supply chain in dealing with some of the uh, uh, equipment and switches and things. But we were hoping to be in it in June to July of this year. Uh, That might be pushed uh, a little bit into the early fall, uh, but we're waiting on some supply chain issues. And and this is happening Mm -hmm. across the country, Mm -hmm. uh, but that is going to be a uh, a significantly sized facility because we currently have 20 sites of care in Atlanta. And what we want to do is really have an even larger focus and that Cobb County multi-specialty clinic is, is going to do that. Uh, in addition, we are uh, going to be uh, adding new CLC or community living center beds. Sometimes people will refer to that as a nursing home, but it's really more than a nursing home. It's the home of the veteran, and they can also do short-term rehabilitation. Uh, and that uh, certainly at the Trinka Davis uh, Veterans Village in Carrollton. And I also want to let you know, they had uh, their survey about two weeks ago, uh, and they had zero findings during their survey. Uh, and so that's impressive when you can have a medical facility have no findings in a survey. Uh, And so that's something. And then lastly, there's this thing called the market assessments that the mission law is requiring the entire VA to uh, undergo. And uh, the the results of those are going to be published uh, next month. So I'm, I'm not able to speak to them yet because the secretary of the VA wants us to tell our staff first. But what I can tell you is that the Atlanta VA is going to benefit significantly from the recommendations. Those recommendations will go to the president and then the president will forward them to Congress uh, for a vote. And this, this VA in Atlanta is certainly going to have even more opportunities 
for growth than what I've just mentioned, if those things come to fruition. And because the veterans have voted with their feet to live here, uh, I anticipate that, that we're going to see significant uh, growth. And the other parts of the state will also see growth, but Atlanta by far is seeing the largest growth. Well, we look forward to that. And that's amazing to hear. I know our veterans definitely are so anxiously awaiting any, you know, additional benefits that they can get. Uh, and they're so deserving. But, you know, I do hear this concern, you know, time and time again, you know, many veterans have reported to my office that they were just unable to reach their providers by phone. And that it's just difficult to get a hold of the people at the, at the VA by telephone. And I've long kind of expressed those concerns with the VA leadership. And I continue to be concerned any time our veterans are having trouble accessing the care that they deserve uh, through the VA. Can you just share any updates on improvements being made to the phone system at the Atlanta VA Medical Center? Yes, and, and thank you uh, for asking, because this is important. Uh, we know that a, we put a brand new phone system in there, uh, and it was a, it's a Cisco brand uh, system, and it uh, did not go in uh, smoothly. There is no doubt. And so things have been going on to increase the uh, amount of, of that can go in the queue to wait, so to speak. Uh, and so that's one thing. The other is that we are in the process of working with uh, another vision, the one that's in Florida, uh, and it's, they are hiring additional staff. And then they're also going to be available through uh, VA Health Connect to actually help us answer those calls. And then they will have providers available. Uh, so uh, that uh, we're in the process of uh, getting that set up. They are actually hiring and have begun to hire staff. And so that will also help all of the VAs in, in Vision 7, and Atlanta will be the first one online uh, with that. Uh, in addition, we, we really want to encourage veterans to use the My Healthy Vet. Uh, this is where one can uh, send a message to the provider. They can request refills. There's even a separate app to request uh, refills. So things that... Uh, you could actually uh, get set up to happen without having to talk with someone. So we're also encouraging the My Healthy Vet, uh, which is what we also call secure messaging, where you can send messages, but you can also request refills because pharmacy is one of the main reasons for folks calling. But again, the phone system, we're continuing to monitor it. We've added capacity uh, and we are partnering uh, with Vision 8 to actually bring in what's called uh, VA Health Connect that will actually 24-7 uh, have clinicians that would be able to see the record and over 90% of the time have what we call first resolution call so that the person doesn't have to keep calling back. And so those are the things that we have in place and are working to have in place to change this. And I can tell you also from the uh, uh, last month, uh, or excuse me, in July, there were 600 cases within the advocate system. And when I looked uh, last uh, week, there were only uh, about uh, uh, 30 cases waiting to be worked down. So the facility has also been working with their advocate system to actually resolve cases uh, because our desired outcome is not for people to be unable to reach us. Well, thank you. And Dr. Walker, I really want to thank you again for your engagement with my office and for just taking some time out of your busy day today to speak with me and everyone who has joined us on this webinar. We really, really appreciate it. It's truly an honor to have you with us. And I really look forward to the next time that we're going to be able to connect with you. I understand that you have another event that you've got to get to this morning as well. I, I understand that 100%. Yes. So just please extend my thanks and appreciation to your whole team at Vision 7. Um, we really appreciate you 
thank everything that you're doing to just upgrade the standard of care for our veterans and our families and those that have just put so much on the line for America. Okay. Well, you're welcome. And I certainly uh, do. Uh, I also get my care at the Atlanta VA and I trust in the clinicians there. Uh, and uh, basically our uh, expectation is to meet the veterans expectation. That's our desired outcome. And thank you for your engagement and support. Thank you. Well, we will now move into our conversation about suicide prevention and firearm safety. As I introduced earlier uh, in the morning, I am pleased that we have Lauren Rushin and Doretha Barber here with us. They are two licensed clinical social workers who work on the suicide prevention team at the Atlanta VA Medical Center. And in just a moment, Lauren, Dere Lauren and Doretha are going to actually share a presentation and answer some additional questions from our audience, moderated by Megan. Lauren and Doretha, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Congresswoman McDuff. We are honored to be here from the Lancer VA Healthcare System Suicide Prevention Program. And I will, here's our presentation. We will be going over some really, really, really very sensitive but key topics with the VA programs. And, and this will be, we'll be covering save and lethal means safety initiatives. And Lauren, she'll be presenting the first portion of this program. Thanks so much, Doretha, and thank you again, Congresswoman, for having us here today. We are really honored to be a part of this important conversation. Um, please note that this is uh, obviously a very sensitive topic, and so um, you'll see on this slide that we want to just let you know that we understand that suicide is an intense topic, and a lot of you may have different experiences or have been impacted by suicide. So if you need to take a break or step away, you are welcome to do so. And of course, if you or someone you know is in need of um, mental health support or in crisis, you can always call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline or Crisis Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 and press one if you're a service member or a veteran. So on the next slide, we'll start with some data just to show you the scope of veteran suicide. And um, the VA keeps extremely detailed records uh, about our veterans, including um, any kind of reason for death. And so as you see from 2001 until 2019, you can see on the, um, the left-hand side are the amounts of deaths, and on the bottom are the years. And so, you know, the good news is from 2017 to 2019, we did see a decrease in um, the rate of suicide death, which is definitely a good thing, but we're also still very concerned because either way, when we look at the trend, it's still upwards and one death by suicide, particularly in our veteran community is too many. And so um, this just gives you a breakdown. On the next slide, you'll see even more of a breakdown. Um, our veterans um, are represented in the blue color, whereas their non-veteran counterparts are represented in the orange color. And as you can see, um, the veterans are much more impacted by suicide versus their non-veteran counterparts. And again, while we have observed a decrease in the rates, um, this is still far too many people dying of suicide when we know that suicide is so preventable and that there are services that are here and ready to help support our veterans in need. So on the next slide, when we think about suicide, we like to think about risk, protect, risk versus protective factors. So risk factors are characteristics that are associated with um, increased likelihood for suicide, whereas um, protective factors do just that. They protect um, and support our veterans so that in times of stress, um, you know, they have things that are more grounding. And so when we think of risk factors, we think of things like somebody who has um, a prior suicide attempt or mental health and or substance use issues would be more at risk for suicide. We also think of our psychosocial challenges. So our veterans who've had, um, you know, legal, financial, housing, employment issues, recent losses, which can even include relationship losses. Um, and obviously, um, you know, when we think of the pandemic, a lot of that can also be wrapped up in that. 
So we want to try to decrease those risk factors and increase those protective factors. We also know that protective factors include access to mental health care, which we were just speaking about earlier on this call, um, as well as a sense of connectedness, which can include connectedness to your mental health or medical care providers, to the VA community, um, problem solving skills, a sense of pure spirituality and purpose or mission, physical health, employment, and social and emotional well-being. And so we also know that there are some um, risk factors and, and protective factors, and we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to increase those protective factors while we decrease those risk factors. And that's a lot of what the VA does. On the next slide, we're going to talk about how the VA is here to teach um, our whole community about ways that we can help veterans at risk for suicide. So if you've ever been to the VA, you know that the VA likes acronyms. And so our acronym to help you remember to um, you know, do everything you can to help and support a veteran in need of, and in crisis is called SAVE. And we'll go through each step of this SAVE um, acronym. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see that S stands for signs. So signs of suicidal thinking um, can really vary from one person to another. Um, it can include hopelessness or feeling like there is no way out. Um, for some people, it will include anxiety or agitation. Others, it will include rage and anger, um, you know, feeling like there's not a reason to be here anymore, um, engaging in any kind of high-risk activity, um, alcohol use, drug use, withdrawing from friends. And then most importantly, a couple of the most, um, you know, concerning red flags and signs of suicidal thinking that really require immediate um, follow-up and involvement include um, if a veteran is talking about um, or thinking about hurting themselves or killing themselves, actively looking at and talking about ways that they would die, um, talking about death or dying, giving away their belongings, um, and as well as self-destructive or risk-taking behaviors such as um, increased uh, promiscuity, driving fast, um, alcohol or drug use, particularly when there's also firearms involved. Those are the ones that require immediate outreach and our Veterans Crisis Line stands available to assist those veterans. So when we think of our SAVE acronym, S is for signs of suicidal thinking. A stands for asking the question. And again, we understand that this is not something that normally people talk about, but we know that people, some people think about suicide. And so if you are concerned that somebody you know may be in crisis or may be thinking of suicide, you want to ask them plainly, are you thinking about killing yourself? You want to ask them if you've identified any kind of warning signs, and you want to ask in a way that's natural. You certainly don't want to ask the question with a negative by saying, you aren't thinking about killing yourself, are you? Or wait till they're you know, halfway out the door because we want you to ask them in a way that feels meaningful and caring so that the veteran feels that they can open up. So S stands for signs, A stands for asking the questions. On the next slide, we move to V, which stands for validate the veteran's experience. And that's just speaking to um, talking openly about suicide and being willing to listen and allow the veteran to express his or her feelings. Um, also being non-judgmental um, and recognizing that this is a very serious situation. So an example of a validating experience if somebody was telling you that they feel hopeless and there's no way out, you might say something like, it sounds like you've got a lot going on and I'm glad you're sharing that with me. Um, so that's an example of a validating experience. We never wanna say something like, that's okay, it'll get better because even though your intention might be good, um, that doesn't necessarily validate that the veteran is going through something really serious and may need some help. So S is for signs, A is for asking the question, V is for validating the experience. And then on the next slide, E is for encourage treatment and expedite getting help. So if somebody um, that you know uh, is suicidal, you wanna make sure that you're not keeping their behavior or their thoughts a secret. Even if they ask you to, you're, do, you're getting help for them so that we can help protect the person. So you never wanna leave a veteran alone that you are concerned may be suicidal. That would include on the phone. You wanna keep the veteran on the phone versus hanging up. Um, you also wanna to try to get the person to seek help immediately. So that might be through contacting his or her doctor, 
or therapist, going to the nearest emergency room, calling 911, or um, calling our crisis line, which is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to our veterans. And that number is on this slide, which is 1-800-273-8255 and press one. So if you think somebody um, may be suicidal, you want to encourage them to get treatment. So you might say something like, um, I, I understand that you're going through a lot and I want you to know that there's help available and I'll do whatever I can to support you and then call that crisis line. So that's our SAVE training, which we um, are very, very grateful to be able to present to you today in this format because that acronym can help you save a life um, and hopefully many lives. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that the VA has a really um, robust public health strategy to address veteran suicide. And we know that we can't do this alone. So while we can address some of these clinically based um, best practice interventions, what we really need to do is partner with our communities, just like you all today, so that we can make sure that we are using a full public health model to address suicide. On the next slide, this gives you a little bit of a breakdown of some of the different um, ways that we can use both clinical outcomes, um, which include safety planning and suicide prevention services, which myself and my team provide, as well as many of our counterparts throughout the country, um, treatment engagement, satisfaction with care, um, and then the community outcomes that, um, that Ms. Barber is going to speak to in just a moment. Thanks so much for covering the SAVE portion of this presentation, Lauren. And I also wanted to add that SAVE is offered to all new employees of the VA, and they receive also annual refreshers on this particular training. Next slide. Just to emphasize the importance of our community outcomes, I want to focus this portion on SAFE firearm storage. Because firearms are the most lethal means of suicide, that is why this particular outcome is so important and why the VA is adopting initiatives that will increase our veteran safety and look at the fact that firearm usage is high in this particular population. So just to give you a little background and some data, nearly 90% of firearm related suicide attempts are fatal. And this is compared to just 5% of all other suicide attempts. Nearly 70% of all veteran suicide attempts involve firearms. And our next slide will show you some various methods and data in reference to this. So as you can see, methods um, fall under several categories. You have firearms, you have um, poisoning, suffocation, and then there's a list. There's some other um, types of means um, and methods that are used for suicide. Wow, what's on? Matters. Um, the method is what matters the most. And so in 2019, 69.2% of veteran suicide deaths were due to self-inflicted firearm injury, while 47.9% of non-veteran adult suicides resulted from a firearm injury. So on the next slide, we'll show you why lethal means safety is so important and why the VA is adopting initiatives that focus specifically on this and counseling with veterans on the importance of it. of it. As you can see, building time and space between the impulse to act and the means to harm oneself saves lives. This slide depicts the importance of that. And while some suicide crises last a long time, most last minutes to hours. So just take a note of that, minutes to hours. So in one study of suicide attempt survivors, 47% said it took less than one hour between their decision to attempt suicide and the actual suicide attempt. 24% said it took less than five minutes for them to act. The time between when a person decides to die by suicide and the, and, the, and the actual act and the decision is often very short. A 2005 study, which is shown here, shows that 71% of attempt to, attempters estimated that the process took less than an hour. 
This reality stresses the importance of reducing access to means for those who are at elevated risk, especially during those, those crisis states, at least until the risk period passes. So some key takeaways from this particular slide is that access to lethal means increases suicide risk for everyone living in a home. The acute phase of a suicidal crisis is often very brief and building in time and space, even if it's 30 to 60 minutes between an impulse to act and the means to harm oneself is what actually saves lives. And the next slide will cover some of those storage options. All right, so what you can see on this diagram in this particular slide shows various ways that the VA endorses safe storage. Those include free gun locks that are provided at your VA. This, the gun lock initiative is one of the best practices that was adopted from other VA sites as a whole. And we also have a new gun lock note that veterans can um, access gun, gun requests through their providers. And so there's also an educational piece that's embedded within that gun lock note. So when a veteran is working with their vet, with their providers through telehealth, um, whatever their you know, clinic visits are, that provider and any provider can actually put in a note and request a gun lock and provide that educational piece to the veteran. Those locks are mailed out by the suicide prevention team. And we also provide locks at all outreach events that are conducted throughout our communities. I'm a gun lock, I have a gun lock and I'm a gun owner. I'm a veteran and I'm a 20 year veteran coming up in April. And I am pleased to have this particular option and to be able to offer up, up gun locks to our veterans through crisis line when they call in in different situations. I've also given veterans up to 10 gun locks at one time. So it's a very valuable service. We don't put restrictions or limitations. I do call and talk with veterans when there's an, a mass number of gun locks that they are asking for, just to make sure that we have extra safety protocols that are in place. Next slide, please. Next, I'm gonna go over some suicide prevention resources. Starting with the next slide, which is our Reach Out, Reach Out initiative. This initiative in this campaign was adopted last year during a Suicide Prevention Month um, activities and is a very successful campaign. Next slide. Next, we have the Psych Armor, which is a free 25 minute long available resource to veterans and caregivers that gives them similar safe training to what you watch today. Next slide. Then we have Coaching Into Care. It's a national telephone service of the VA, Coaching Into Care. It aims to educate, support, and empower family members and friends who are seeking care for services for veterans. Next slide. Then we have Make the Connection. Make the Connection is an online resource that connects veterans, their families, and, them, and their families and friends and other supporters with information and solutions to issues affecting them throughout their lives. Next slide. Then we have the VA, um, that in our VA, we're publishing and distributing a community toolkit to help prevent veteran suicide through safe storage of firearm options. We've actually partnered with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention and the National Shooting Sports Foundation. And this is one of VA's first firearm industry partners. The objectives of the program are to educate the community about the significance of safely storing firearms when not in use and to motivate engagement and safe storage practices. Also to increase awareness of that suicide is preventable and endorse the role of safe storage to reduce firearm injury. It also aims to educate firearm owners, family members and friends about ways they can help prevent suicides by firearm. Next, we have our link to and our, our go-to uh, brochure on lethal means safety resources. This brochure is often provided during outreach events to go along with our gun lock initiatives. 
Next slide. In our community partner toolkit, we like to um, support behavioral health and wellness of veterans receiving services outside the VA as well. Resources are available in this toolkit that include information on screening for military service handouts and trainings to increase knowledge about military culture and many clinics focused on relevant aspects of behavioral health and wellness. Next slide. Together we can. The VA released a suicide prevention informational series for veterans, their families, and caregivers about common suicide risk and protective factors. And this slide shows a link to that particular service. Next slide. As Dr. Walker mentioned before, the VA and DOD approved, has approved apps that are available for iPhone and Android users to help them with coping skills in between therapy sessions. This is very vital to connect our veterans to resources that are gonna help them improve their outcomes. Next slide. One of those particular um, uh, mobile apps is PTSD Coach. They also on this app have a new safety plan feature. Users can create a safety plan on their own with their provider or with their supportive contacts through this app. And that particular safety plan mirrors the one that that's located in the electronic health care record that their providers use. Next slide. Last but not least is our post pension services that are now offered at the Atlanta VA. This is to assist families who are coping with the loss and veterans that are coping with the loss of other veterans by suicide. We would like to thank all that participate in this webinar today and in support of suicide prevention initiatives at Atlanta VA. Well, Lauren and Doretha, thank you so very much for these very critically important presentations today. And your work is so vital to the mission of the VA. And I'm just so glad that the VA has people like you on its staff. I really, really do. And now I believe that Megan is going to moderate just a few audience questions for you both. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank uh, you. So. I just want to echo uh, the Congresswoman's remarks that suicide prevention is so important. And as a veteran, I uh, have a, you know, a very close, um, it's a very important to me. So I want to make sure that if you are a veteran, if you're a family member and you are concerned about a veteran to reach out for help and our office is here to help share any resources that you need. I am the veteran and military caseworker for the Congresswoman, and I handle most of her veteran casework, and I'm happy to help in any way that we can. So um, we do have a few questions that were submitted prior to uh, the event. And the first question is, in the VA's 2021 National Suicide Prevention Annual Report, the average number of veteran suicides per day in 2019 was 17.2. Do you have any data to show more recent veteran suicides? I know the VA um, provides those updates um, in a an annual report, but it's usually a couple of years later. So do you know about what time frame we can expect those numbers? So, all, so as we already know, suicide prevention is the VA's top priority. And as such, there have been considerable investments that were made to increasing staffing. So we're able to forecast and make projections based on our state or in, in regards to things that we can plan for in the future, like increasing personnel and staff with the veteran crisis line to respond to those critical needs. And we're also increasing resources for our nation's veterans. Our current strategy augments our ongoing internal effort by combining with community partners to implement clinical strategies for interventions on a broad spectrum. So although 2019 is the most updated information we have, it would be remiss if I did not highlight some of those anchors of hope that were pulled from that particular data and then what it looks like moving ahead based on our, our, our data from that particular period. One of those um, community, uh, the, oh, those anchors, I'm sorry, of hope highlighted that there were few, there were 399 fewer veterans that died from suicide in 2019 compared to 2018. 
that's an important hope and anchor. So there was also nearly 13% um, in one year rate decrease with our female population of veterans, which represents the largest rate decrease from women veterans in over 17 years span. And while COVID rates and COVID um, data is still continuing to merge, data this Far does, does not indicate an increase with veteran suicide related behavior. So we do know this based on predictions from the past. Thank you, Doretha. You're welcome. So the second question, are there any categories of veterans excluded from the veteran suicide rate, such as suicide incidents resulting from domestic violence? The VA is leading the way with tracking data and trends related to suicide behaviors and events. Our vital statistics come from the VA DOD um, mortality data repository, which contains mortality data from the, the CDC National Death Index. So the VA also conducts its own behavioral health autopsies on all suicides and any contributory factors that may be present in that electronic record or through um, reports from family members. Some of these do include um, intimate partner violence situations, the diagnostic information, psychosocial stressors that could be contributory factors to suicide and things, uh, and things such as that. One leading preventative method, method that I want to highlight that the VA does um, practice is the, with the ReachFat, which is the Recovery Engagement Treatment um, VET program. What that does is the VA uses metrics. So it's, it's, it combines technology and data analysis and all those things, but they use metrics um, to review electronic rec health records to identify veterans with complex health needs. And they pull this data and it helps predict things like um, risk for suicide, increased hospitalizations, illnesses and other adverse outcomes. So we're able to identify anywhere from 100 to 120 veterans per month through the ReachVet program. This information is pulled and collected, and then we reach out to veterans and try to connect them to care and determine if enhancements are clinically indicated with those particular cases. This may decrease the likelihood of mental health and adverse medical outcomes and improve overall health and well-being for our veterans. Great. And the third question, does the VA provide safe storage options to veterans and families? Um, so I know that you talked about that during your slide um, and you mentioned that those are free. Um, they can request that through any provider, correct? Correct. Currently safe storage is addressed as a part of the educational component of lethal means safety and planning discussions. The VA readily provides gun locks to veterans and caregivers during outreach events and through um, alerting suicide prevention team, which is connected to their, their um, care at the Atlanta VA as well. We endorse a wide range of options, not just locks, but also we endorse cable um, gun cases, lock boxes, electronic lock boxes. I myself use a gun cable. I use a um, electronic box that has a digital and a thumbprint. And I also remove my weapon from my, my um, I'm sorry, not my weapon, but my, I, my magazine for my weapon when I store it as well. So those are all safe gun practices that the VA endorses. And I forgot to mention this during our governor's challenge, we're in, involved in the lethal means reduction task force. And in the near future, we have endeavors to expand our um, community partnerships with incorporating a community engagement and partnership coordinator. They are going to be embedded within suicide team programming. So I think this will be an added addition and we'll be able to reach reach our community partners, build coalitions at community, state, and federal levels aimed at reducing veteran suicides. Great. I look, to, I look forward to seeing more about that program. Um, are, there any, are there any tips you can provide to family members of veterans on how to talk to their veteran about safe storage? Um, thanks for asking. That's a really great question. And we know that talking to other people, particularly fire, um, firearm owners, can be challenging when you're talking about restricting access. And so what we would recommend is that caregivers um, and families frame it more so instead of talking about taking away or limiting or reducing access, but talking about it more so in terms